You know how in the New Testament we got upgraded by the Holy Spirit, and God said in the book of Revelation that we shall be a kingdom of priests? Wait, he said that to the Israelites in Exodus 19.6. You shall be to me a kingdom of priests. Hmm. Yeah, but Jesus said to love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your strength, and that's the New Testament. Oh wait, God already said that in Deuteronomy 6. Huh. Yeah, but Jesus also said that man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Ha! Oh wait, God the Father already said that all in Deuteronomy 8, word for word. Jesus said, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, quoting Hosea 6. When Jesus said, I open my mouth in parables, he was quoting Psalm 77. When Peter wrote of God, be holy, for I am holy, he was literally quoting Leviticus three times. There's almost a thousand references to the Old Testament in the New Testament, so maybe we need to be as good as reading the front of the book as we are the back of it. The parallels between Adam and Noah are insane. Both Adam and Noah were on the earth after the waters submerged and dry land appeared. Both were the head over the new creation. In both accounts, God reiterates that mankind is made in the image and likeness of God, and then immediately blesses them and then commands them to be fruitful and multiply. Noah planted a vineyard just like God had planted a garden. Adam ate of the vine, his eyes were opened, and his nakedness had to be covered. Noah drank of the vine, his eyes were opened upon awakening, and his nakedness had to be covered. Both had curses placed upon their family lines after falling into sin. Both of their third sons, Seth and Shem, were in the lineage of the Messiah. Both point to and are fulfilled in Jesus Christ, the last Adam, the head over the new creation who, like Noah, births a new world world where righteousness dwells. So what does the shofar from the Old Testament have to do with me today? It has two main purposes. It's used as a call to war and as a proclamation of freedom. Those seem to be contradictory but actually go hand in hand. Show far, show good? Take Jericho, for instance. God commanded Joshua to have seven priests in front of the Ark of the Covenant, and on the seventh day, on the seventh time, marching around Jericho, they blew the shofars and all the walls of Jericho came crashing down. The shofar is a symbol of breaking down the strongholds of the enemy and proclaiming freedom for the prisoner. The shofar was blown at the temple all throughout Jesus' life, and Jesus always heeded the call of the shofar. To commemorate Passover, the shofar would be blown and the Jews would gather at the temple and then the Passover lamb would be slaughtered at 3 o'clock. Which, during the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, Jesus was hanging on the cross and the shofar would have been blown at the exact moment that Jesus cried out to the Father and the Lamb of God was slaughtered at 3 o'clock. Why did Paul continue to keep the Sabbath on Saturday throughout the book of Acts after the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Acts 17.2 Then Paul, as his custom was, went into them and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the scriptures. Acts 13.14 They came to Antioch, went into the synagogue on the Sabbath, and sat down. Acts 13.42 So when the Jews went out of the synagogue, the Gentiles begged that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. Even the Gentiles were keeping the Sabbath back then. Acts 18.4 Paul stayed with them and worked as a tent maker, and he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath, and persuaded both Jews and Greeks every Sabbath. In fact, 85 Sabbaths are mentioned in the book of Acts as being kept by Paul and the apostles. If God kept the Sabbath during the first week of creation, and the Israelites kept the Sabbath because God commanded them to, and the Sabbath is one of the Ten Commandments and we definitely keep the other nine, and Jesus himself kept the Sabbath, and Paul and the apostles continue to keep the Sabbath after the death and resurrection of Jesus, and all believers will continue to keep the Sabbath during the millennial reign of Christ, and there's no new command of God switching the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday, then why did we switch it to Sunday? In actuality, the switch of the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday took place well after the New Testament had been written and all the apostles had died. Constantine switched the Sabbath to Sunday in 321 AD, and we've been keeping it that way ever since because it's a man-made tradition that we were born into and we don't know any better. What I've heard is that Jesus raised to life on Sunday, and so now that's the Lord's Day. But the Sabbath is made for rest, and how can you get 
get more of a perfect picture of rest than lying dead in the tomb. And then when he arises and resurrects, hey, let's get to work. We've got people to see. We've got places to go. We've got faith to instill. This has nothing to do with being saved or not being saved. It's more just getting onto the heartbeat and the rhythm of God himself. What was the Bible that Jesus used? Have you ever thought about that? Jesus read the law, the prophets, and the writings, aka the Old Testament. But Jesus never called it the Old Testament. Jesus called it the scriptures. So maybe we shouldn't be so quick to brush off verses if they're from the Old Testament. In order to defeat Satan after 40 days of temptation in the desert, Jesus stood on verses from the Old Testament because all of scripture is God breathed. When Paul wrote all scripture is God breathed, the New Testament as we know it didn't even exist. The early church, which was filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, only had the Old Testament scriptures. The New Testament church was the New Testament church before the New Testament was written. The New Testament either quotes or alludes to the Old Testament nearly a thousand times. The Old Testament is the foundation that the New Testament is built on. We can't fully understand what Jesus is always talking about or the prophecies that he fulfills if we don't understand the Old Testament. Or should I phrase it, if we don't understand the scriptures. Bless Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial, for he will receive the crown of life. God redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with loving kindness. You will be a crown of glory in the hand of the Lord and a royal diadem in the hand of thy God. The Lord will save them in that day, for they are as stones of a crown sparkling in his land. For you meet him with blessings of good things and you set a crown of fine gold on his head. I am coming quickly. Hold fast to what you have so that no one will take your crown. There is laid up for me the crown of righteousness which the Lord will award to all who have loved his appearing. In that day the Lord of hosts will become a beautiful crown and a glorious diadem to the remnant of his people. As the bride of Christ we know that an excellent wife is the crown of her husband. When the chief shepherd appears you will receive the unfading crown of glory. The Bible of Jesus was the Old Testament or what he refers to as the scriptures. And in order to defeat Satan and his temptations, Jesus stood on verses from Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 8 verse 3, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Satan came back with Psalm 91 11. He will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. Jesus responded with Deuteronomy 6 16. Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Satan then told Jesus, he would give him all the kingdoms of the world if he would just bow and worship him. Jesus responded with Deuteronomy 6.13, Fear the Lord your God and serve him only. Jesus himself was using scriptures from the Old Testament to defeat Satan from books in the Bible that we joke about from the pulpit because they're so boring. Maybe we should start referring to the Old Testament as what Jesus calls them the scriptures. King David was a terrible and perfect example of being impulsive. In 2 Samuel we read about David who spied on Bathsheba while she was bathing and he just had to have her. And unlike the rest of his life he didn't first inquire of the Lord. Why not? Because he knew the law. Leviticus 20 says, If a man commits adultery with another man's wife, both the adulterer and the adulteress should be put to death. He acted on his desires and then he had to hide it. Then he committed more sins to cover up the first sin. This costed David his newborn child, he lost control of his other children, and his great name was defamed in the land. Truly, David deserved the death penalty several times over. God gave us his laws not to put a burden on us, but to protect us from us. 